Hey everybody here, welcome to another Optics Lab and uh, what I call the second half of our optics. Uh, let me just kind of summarize what you saw in the lecture. Uh, our first two chapters on optics are often referred to as geometric optics or even just sometimes called ray optics. And it really had to do not so much with the wave nature of light, but just the fact that the light travels in a straight line. And, and, and for example, the last lab we did, we made all these images. And we had, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, lens equation where we had, you know, 1 over P plus 1 over Q equals 1 over F. And all of those were done with rays or geometric or geometry. And so chapters, I guess it would be, uh, 35 and 36 of Surway or chapters 1 and 2 in the third volume of the OpenStax book. All of those we're doing with geometry. And then the second half of our introduction to optics, so we're doing a total of four chapters here on introduction to optics. The second half, and so I guess this would be chapters 3 and 4 in the OpenStax and uh, 30. 37 and 38 in the uh, survey book, but they have to do with the wave nature. And so a lot of the stuff that I hope is beginning to sink in is that the wave nature that we learned way back at the beginning of this semester, you can start to apply to our optics. And one of those was superpositioning, that is constructive and destructive interference. And today's lab is designed that way. We are going to run an experiment with a Michelson interferometer. And so we talked about the, the Michelson interferometer interferometer there at the end of chapter, I guess it's 37, um, and uh, in the, the Michelson interferometer, uh, there's a discussion about how two waves come together, and if two crests come together, you get constructive interference, and if a crest lines up with a trough, you get destructive. Oh, watch. Let me come over here to the side of the board and, and let me just kind of e explain the Michelson interferometer again. So if you take a beam of light, and so here's my beam of light, and so this will be my inputted light, a and if you take that beam and you split it into two pieces, Okay, and uh, so this first little glass piece is what we call a 50% mirror. Uh, you might, uh, you know, think of this as the tinted glass you would see on a car window or, or something. And it, it reflects half the light, but it also lets half the light go through. And so notice all of our discussions about this interference, whether it be this, which is the Michelson interferometer, or whether it be the thin films we talked about, or whether it be the uh, Fabry-Perot interferometer, or even going way back to the beginning of this semester, we had that uh, blue acoustic interferometer. Uh, an acoustic because we were dealing with sound waves, the principle is still the same. That is, you need two beams, you need to bring them together, and as they come together, the question is, do you have constructive or do you have destructive interference? So, we start with one beam, that way we know that the two beams are going to be correlated, and so this is what we have. We have one beam coming in. We hit this 50% mirror, so I'll just say 50% mirror, and half of it goes, and in my drawing, it will go down, and the other half will continue on. Let me call this mirror number one and mirror number two. And mirror number one reflects the beam, and mirror number two also reflects the beam. Now let me pause on my drawing and come back here to my equipment, because I have it set up um, already a little bit uh, adjusted, so that would save some time uh, adjusting it here on the, on, the, on the video. But I do want you to see, this is my laser beam, this is the light coming in, and as the light comes in, this first one right here is the beam splitter. 
So it bounces off and goes, and I'll call this the down mirror. So in my picture, this is mirror number one. And then it can go through and hit this mirror, mirror number two, and bounce back. Now, come back over here to my drawing. So mirror number two is the main mirror in this problem because mirror number two is on an adjustable or I should say a movable track and I can actually then change the position of mirror number two. Well, watch, come back over here to the equipment. So here's mirror number two. Uh, I don't know how well you can, you can see but it's mounted inside of a hole right here. So it, it, unlike everything else which is mounted on this top plate, mirror number two is actually mounted on a level below and there's a hole cut out. So when I turn this knob up in front, I'll call front towards you, so when I turn that, that moves the mirror. And this little device actually has some small uh, tick marks on it. Each tick mark moves this mirror one millionth of a meter one micrometer, okay? So that's movable. It even says on the side here, movable mirror. It even says right here, one division on here is equal to one micron, okay? And so we're going to need to know that number here for a moment, but I will just say this is the main part of this experiment, the movable mirror. Okay, come back over here to the drawing because an interferometer, and of course anything involving interference, is using that principle of superpositioning, which we learned back in chapter 16 at the second week of the semester where we talked about waves coming together. So using the wave nature of light here, I'm going to bring these two beams back together, and here's, here's how it happens. After bouncing off mirror one, it will hit this 50% mirror again, uh, which means, of course, 50% of it heads off to the left. I'm going to ignore that. It's the 50% of the 50%, so by this time we're down to 25% of the light, is heading off in this direction. And this is where I'm going to put my screen. Because watch the other ray, the other ray that went through and hit mirror number two, the movable mirror, then bounces off and hits this 50% mirror again. And half of it, of course, goes through, and I'm not going to pay any attention to that, but another 50%. So 50% of 50%, so 25%. So I've got 25% of the original beam on each of them. But the point is they came together. Now collectively together, they only have half the energy as the original one. But not worrying about that, I have then a perfect recipe because now they are together. And so if I get it all aligned, so they come together, and they will now be overlapping, and of course, I won't see that until they hit a screen and reflect off. So I'll be the observer over here, and maybe I should say we will be the observer, and we'll take a look at that screen. And we'll ask ourselves, as the light hits the screen and bounces off, what is the intensity? Is it bright? Is it dark? Is it something in between? And of course, it would be bright if the two beams, when they come together, a crest lines up with a crest, which I guess also means a trough lines up with a, a trough. And so the amplitudes add together. However, it would be dark, uh, what we call destructive interference, if the crest of one of them, let's say this beam that hit mirror number two, lined up with a trough of mirror number one. 
But here's the neat thing about it. If you move mirror number two a small distance, then whatever was happening a moment ago on the screen, let's just say it was bright, because of that extra length now will go dark. Of course, if you move the mirror even further, it'll go bright again because our interference effect changes based upon how far is the path difference between those two beams. In fact, you might remember our discussion for lecture. I called this delta R. It was labeled as R2 minus R1. And what I meant by that was that if one beam, let's call this path number two going to mirror number two and this path number one going here, if path number two is further or shorter, but I'll just say further, is further than number one by say a half wavelength, then the crests of this one will line up with the troughs of this one or the other way around, the crests of this one will line up with the troughs of that one and we will get destructive interference. All right, so this is the, the key. Actually, I should have paused there for a second because none of that, I, what I just said, none of that included the phase changes. And that's a big issue that uh, I tried to drive home with the thin films. And we do have some phase changes uh, going on. And so depending on the type of interferometer you have, uh, you may have an even number of phase changes or an odd number of phase changes. And so some of them, when the path difference is zero, are bright, and some of them are, are, are dim. It turns out, for our model, they go dim when the path difference is actually the same. We have an odd number of, of phase changes. Uh, so I say that just for clarity. And also to emphasize, we have to consider phase changes in the more general sense. And that's the thing that's hard about those thin films that, I, that I'm sure you're struggling with the homework right now on is, is getting that straight in your mind. Oh wait, is that constructive or destructive? I got the path difference, but you have to include not only the path difference, but the number of phase changes. And I said it a little quick because for what we're going to do in the lab today, we don't need to worry about the phase changes. They're, 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 ju they're just not relevant for what we want to do. So that's why I said it and then in my head I was going, God, do I say anything more? Uh, do I, you know, take three minutes and explain? Uh, it's a short lab so I decided, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm going to explain that we really should uh, take care of phase changes if we want to get the total answer. But that's not what we want to do. Here's what we want to do. We just want to move the mirror and realize that if they were already lined up so that it was bright, if you move this mirror back or forward, but I'm, I'm just going to move it back. If you move this mirror back, then path number two is longer by, and check this out, I'll put a little dotted line. If I move number two back by a distance of D, the extra path difference is 2D. Did you catch that? Right, because the beam would have to go out a distance d and then when it reflects off goes back that extra distance of d again. All right now let me say this. What if this extra path 2d is, and so I'll give some options here, what if that extra path is a half wavelength? What if it is a whole wavelength? Let's talk about both of those options. Okay. So, in other words, if the mirror moves back, and, and, and hear this carefully, 
If the mirror moves back one quarter of a wavelength, so D is one quarter, then the increased path length is a half a wavelength. And that increase of a half a wavelength means if it was bright, it would now be dark. Did you catch that? Or if it was dark, it would now be bright. And so when 2D is a half wavelength, we would go from bright to dark on our screen. Now, well, let me ask kind of the same question. What if 2D is equal to one wavelength? So what if I move the mirror a half wavelength? Did you catch that? I'm going to say it again. What if I mirror the, move the mirror back a half wavelength? See, that would increase the path difference by a whole wavelength, right? I'll say it again. because The wave's got to go down and back. All right. So if I move the mirror a half wavelength back, the path difference being twice that, so 2D, okay, 2D would then be a full wavelength. So what if 2D is a full wavelength? What would happen? Well, if we were already looking at a bright spot, it would change to another bright spot, right? We would go bright to bright. Okay, so, so let me just say it again, because it kind of depends on how our experiment wants to go, because we're going to be looking at the screen. And if we watch the screen go from bright to dark, or it could go the other way around, dark to bright, we know that 2D is a half a wavelength. On the other hand, if we watch it go from bright to bright, or dark to dark, we know that 2D is equal to a full wavelength. All right, so let me come back over to our equipment. As I said, I've, I've got this uh, set up where here's our little red laser beam. It's a little Heaney laser. And the Heaney laser comes in, and, and this right here again is that 50% mirror. And so it goes back to this mirror, which I've called mirror number one, and then comes forward, and then goes towards me. You might even be seeing the little red spot on me, okay? Uh, but also the second beam does this. Second beam comes through here, hits this 50% mirror, and the part that goes through goes right here to this movable mirror, bounces back to this 50% mirror, and then goes towards me. Those two beams come together, and I deliberately, before I turned on the camera, set it up so that it would shine on this wall right here. If I turn down the, the room lights, I can see it better. I don't know how much it changes on the video camera with the auto lighting. But uh, let me call that pretty bright. Okay? Now I'll show you with both the lights on and the light off. Let me start with it on. Uh, but if I come over here to this gearing, as I said, when I turn this gear, it's going to move that mirror back. And if I look at this bright spot right now, I'll say it again, if I move the mirror back a quarter of a wavelength, that means the path deference would increase by a half wavelength. Uh, that means a bright spot would then become a dark spot. We would we'd go from constructive interference to destructive interference. Okay. So there's my, my bright spot. I'm going to turn it a little. Oh, very, very sensitive. Remember, you, we're talking about only the quarter of a wavelength of light. And so maybe I should emphasize that is the beauty of an interferometer. 
whether it be an acoustic interferometer, a Michelson interferometer, a Fabry Perot interferometer, they can measure a fraction of a wavelength, whatever their wavelength is. So if you're talking about visible light, which is small, then we can read changes of something like a quarter of a wavelength or a tenth of a wavelength. That is really, really, really small. Actually, as a, as a, maybe as a side note, because it was, hasn't been but just a few years since science actually recorded uh, the first gravitational waves, they set up an incredibly powerful interferometer. It's a combination of a, a Michelson interferometer and a Fabry Perot interferometer. And they measure when the distance moves. And, 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 and check this out. It's a tenth of the size of the nucleus. 10 to the minus 16 meters. And they can change it. Wow. Incredible. Uh, anyways, ours is not quite that sensitive. <laughs> not even close. But ours can measure about a quarter of a wavelength pretty good because watch right right here it's bright and I'm going to just make a small movement I'll turn it ready go there it goes dark now it looks like I went a little too far did you see it kind of go dark and it started to come back up and so I went a little too far like I said it's real sensitive but there's bright there's dark, there's bright, there's dark, there's bright, there's dark, there's bright. Okay? And so I don't turn it much because it doesn't have to move very, very far. And so ours, like I said, can pick out that bright dark, a quarter of a wavelength, sort of. It's not perfect. You can see it kind of jiggles and bounces around. But I'm hoping you can see it go uh, bright dark. I think it looks better with the lights off. So maybe I'll shut the lights off and, and, and turn it again. And I'll just kind of reach over. There's bright. There's dark. There's bright. There's dark. There's bright. There's dark. There's bright. There's dark. There's bright. And uh, maybe I'll just leave it at a bright. I want to start the experiment at a bright. Okay, so a big part of this lab is to get you, in fact, maybe I even say the main part of this lab, is to get you to better understand the Michelson interferometer and interference in general, but particularly the Michelson interferometer. Because, let me come back over to here and say, oh, watch this. If I were then to stand over here and turn that knob and watch it go bright to bright 50 times. Okay? 50 times. That means I would have changed the path by 50 wavelengths. Okay? And to D then, so this is the distance I move the mirror, and so I move it quite a bit so that it represents bright to bright 50 times. Now, remember, I got little dials over there, so I could actually read what D is, and from that, get the wavelength of this red laser. And that's what we're going to be asked to do here in the lab. And uh, so we're going to run three experiments. Uh, we're going to have a red beam of light. That's the one that's already hooked up. Uh, then we'll hook up a yellow one. And then we'll hook up a green one. And so we're going to hopefully then use this equation three times and figure out what is the wavelength of our red one, our yellow one, and our, our green one, okay? Now, I will say then that um, to get the, the D, 
uh, I have to take some initial reading, let me call it D initial, and subtract D final. Okay, and so my little calipers up here have a, have a reading and I will, I will read them in a second here. And I'm going to write down those numbers. Okay, and so that's going to be my, my D. So maybe for a data table and giving you something that you can turn in, we could say, all right, let's try our three different colors. Uh, let's try the red laser. Uh, then you'll see it's the yellow sodium light. That'll be our second one. Uh, maybe I should put uh, helium neon laser so we know what kind of material we're using. That could be helpful, but this inside of it has helium and neon gas. Uh, the second one we're going to do is going to have a sodium gas. It gives off a yellow. And the third one we're going to do has a green color uh, and it has mercury inside. Okay. So, we will take an initial and a final reading. Um, now, let me just, maybe I should put, call D the absolute value because um, on my scale, I'm going to turn it to actually uh, lower numbers. So, well, so initial minus final will actually work well. <laughs> um, I uh, actually, I, I guess that bothered me a little bit. Usually we say final minus initial, but it wouldn't matter what order if you're just looking at the absolute value. And so the way I wrote it, it's actually pretty good because I'm turning, I'm counting down. Okay. So anyways, this is the big picture right there. What is D? And now let me put the units in here because this is in micrometers micrometers. So when you subtract the two, we're going to get a distance of how far did the mirror move in micrometers. All right. So once I have the D, this is the last part of the lab. And I'm just debating if we should give the wavelength in micrometers or nanometers. I, I know in class we talk about them in nanometers all the time. But maybe it's good to do this in micrometers because everything is set up for micrometers. All right. So let me point out then that this equation for finding the wavelength then, when I bring this 50 to the other side, becomes over 25. So my formula would look like this. The wavelength is the D divided by 25. So the math here is actually pretty easy and once we set it up and talk about the concept, this is a pretty easy lab. So um, if we were face to face, I always tell students that, hey, this is, this, is, this is one of our shorter ones. Sometimes we have long labs, sometimes we have short labs. Last week we had a kind of a long one with those five setups with the lenses. Uh, this week we, we have kind of a short one. And it's to drive home the understanding about superposition and interference and actually see it in action here. So at least the best we can do is see it in action on a, on a video screen here. And so I'm going to hook up my, my interferometer and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run the first experiment here. Okay, so let me, and it looks like I might have bumped it a little bit. I don't know if you'd call that bright or not. Let me turn down. Yeah, okay, I'll call that, I'll call that bright. And yeah, let me turn the uh, lights back on here. Although maybe I won't have to keep turning the lights on and off if I grab my cheap flashlight here. Uh, but let me take an initial reading here. Okay, and this, oh, I hope I gave myself enough room, but I am at, let's see, I guess I should have checked this out. Let's see, 25 times 4 is 100. Okay, so that 1 represents 100. 
So we are a little over 100. I would put us right now at a position of 100.5 micrometers. Okay, let me just double check that. Yep, so there's the 100, okay. And so, let's go ahead and go from bright to bright 50 times. And hopefully, I can turn and count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, and 50. All right. So hopefully I didn't mess up counting, but uh, I think I've done uh, 50 of them. And let me take a new uh, reading. And uh, let's see, one, two, three marks. So three times 25. So it's 75. And it looks like 75 and another nine. Is that 84? Okay, so I've got 84.0. And this is the part I'll, I'll leave to you, although in my own curiosity and make sure things are going a little bit okay, uh, why don't I just take the 100.5 and subtract it and get 84. And so I've got a 16.5, so help you out a little bit there. And then if I divide that by 25, I get a number. Oh, and I'll leave that for you. Okay. And so not a bad number. It's kind of close to what I know this wavelength to be. So I like it. Um, and I was going to say I wish it could be a little closer, but I think given the circumstances, that's about the best we could do. So... <laughs> Got a very reasonable number for for this one. Huh? Did you miscount the flashes? Um, I, it's off a little bit, so I could have miscounted the flashes. I think the biggest problem is you notice every time I turn it, it just shakes so much, and I I, I I think the little it moves a little bit when you take it off, which means you miscount basically. Yeah. So that's kind of the best thing I think we can do. All right. So if that all made sense to you. Well, let's try this all again a second time. Um, this time I'm going to turn off the, the laser beam and move this one aside. So there's the, the red one. Uh, let me get the, the yellow one going. Now, the yellow one is kind of tall on its own, so I don't think I'll need those stands. Uh, here's the one that I was re referring to. Uh, here's the yellow light. And um, won't need a beam expander. And I can just put the lights right there. Now, here's a sad reality about all of this. Is that this light 
is not nearly as bright, which is why I always do the red one first, because the red one was bright enough that I could project it on a screen and count it. Sadly, this second one, you can't quite see it. In fact, even if I turn down the room lights, you won't see it anywhere on here. So the better bet is for me to just come down and look here and look directly in. And that just puts the light directly on my retina. And of course the red one was way too bright for that one. That would have been painful for my eye. But uh, this one is, is perfect uh, for that. Okay. And so now I just have to do the same kind of counting game. Okay. Now, uh, I just wondering if I have enough room here. It looks like we went somewhere in the neighborhood of about 15. I think we'll do less. So we, we should be okay. So I'll just take the starting point as 84, uh, 75 plus 9, yeah, 84.5. In fact, maybe I'll just double check that. But I did like the number we got. Yeah, it looks like a 75 and another 9. Okay. Let me then count 50. And this is a tough one because I need to look in here and turn. And I don't really have... A good way to reach it the way I kind of set it up for you guys. Hmm. Wonder if I moved this back a little bit. Got my hand through here. That would be better. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Oh, shook really bad. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. 21, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50. Whew. All right. And I'll tell you a funny story. This is a tough one. And uh, in some sense, maybe you're glad you're not here face to face. Uh, usually students do this a couple of times because it, it just... It is really hard. It just shakes like crazy. And every time you try to rotate, so it's kind of nice to have a second person. I, I'm going to do, you know, the, the, the best I can. But I love the author. I've never seen this in any other book. But the author says, um, how, does, how does he say it here? He says, uh, be advised that several trials may be required and no cursing is permitted. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I find that humorous because, believe me, you, you just want to curse right now after looking in that thing. Okay, so anyways, I got my 50. Uh, however, I realize you can't look in here. But what I can do is when we're done videotaping this, I'm going to take a still picture looking in there. Um, uh, maybe even could run the motion of the camera in there. We'll see if we can splice that together. So we'll try some experiments to see if you can kind of see what's 
<laughs> what I just saw and uh, see what we get. All right, so with that in mind, uh, let's come over here and take a reading. Uh, let's see, I see two tick marks, so that's 50 times two. I mean, 25 times two, that's, that, that's 50. And it looks like another 20 on top of that. So that makes 70. All right, so I've got an even 70. Now, I don't want to do all of the calculations for you, but I'm kind of curious. So 84, well, I don't even need a calculator for that. 84 minus 70 is 14. Divide that by 25 and pretty decent number. Okay. All right. So all that, there was twice in there where as I was turning it, my, my finger kind of stuck and it kind of shakes it. And I was kind of nervous about our numbers, but that's, that's actually going to come out to be a pretty decent number for yellow light. Okay, good. Uh, and then let's go to the third one, which is a green light. Okay, so let me take the yellow one and kind of move it out of the way. And play the, the same game, uh, but this time I have a light that's got some mercury in it. Ah. And so hopefully you can kind of see the, the green light coming out of here. And so I'm going to put my green light. And this is the smallest and the hardest one. Let's see if I can give myself enough room to get my hand in there. And get it high enough. And let me get down. And and a double reflection, so I, yeah, there it is, okay, pretty sure that's it. So I just want to get the alignments pretty good, See if I can get my arm in here. Um, I didn't, I think I left the lights on last time. I think it might be a little easier for me with the lights off. And, um, well, maybe I'll just write this down so I don't forget, but I'm at 70 even right now. Okay. Oh, I guess I don't have to put micrometers. And uh, fortunately, green's a little shorter wavelength, so maybe I don't have to turn it as far. But uh, let's see what I get. There it goes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50. 
Oh, good. I liked how that one went. It wasn't too much shaking. Whew. Uh, but I still want to curse. All right, but no cursing. All right. <laughs> All right, and so let's see what our distance is now that we've moved the mirror. And let's see, can I see that? I think I can see the second tick mark. So that would be 50 plus 6, so 56. So this is a 56. Ah, which I think that's going to be a pretty decent... Uh, number here because isn't that a 14 and a 14 divided by 20 25 oh i like it all right that's a pretty decent one okay so numbers aren't too bad and i'm glad to, to hear that but uh, believe it or not that's the whole lab it's not a whole long lab but it really is trying to get you to understand the michelson interferometer and again wish you guys were here doing this because uh, this is just it's just kind of fun to see it, even if it is a little bit annoying and jiggling because of the, the, the finesse and the details. That's why uh, in, a, in a big science lab, so when you guys transfer to the university or if you, if you work in this, you'll see that the, their equipment is much more sophisticated. It's balanced on an air table. There's no vibrations, no shocks, and uh, do a lot of things to, to damper that down. However, I, I will say bye for now, but I also I want to then, I'll bring the video camera around and we'll see how much we could capture this on, on video. And so we're going to try to splice in some video of the watching the little black lines go by and me count them. One, two, three. So we'll try it with the green light and the yellow light and then see if we can splice that in and it'll be, I think, a little better for you to see that. All right, bye for now.